Welcome, everybody, so, uh, to this Wednesday's Center for Global Studies talk. Uh, before I introduce uh, our speaker today in Janswood, um, let me go through a few other slides and introduction. Uh, we'll start with our territory acknowledgement. We acknowledge and respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands and the Songhees of Squamalt and the Sunish peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. And I think in terms of our, our commitment to these territory acknowledgements, last night with, um, on World Water Day and the, and the event, the, the wonderful event put on by Polis, uh, I think uh, a real indication, reflection of our commitment to the responsibilities that come with that uh, acknowledgement. Okay, a uh, few housekeeping items, of course, uh, of which you're all aware, including the fact that this presentation is being recorded. We'll ask that you keep your microphones muted and your videos off until we come to the Q&A. We do ask that when we come to the Q&A period that uh, for those of you comfortable uh, with doing so, please do turn on your video. Um, we have a large screen in front of us and it actually does help to have your videos uh, on uh, and, and, and present with us but that you still keep your microphone muted until you have a comment or a question and you can raise your hand, you can use the hand function in the uh, Zoom webinar or um, uh, you can kind of maybe, uh, you can use the chat function as well. Um, and please feel free to use the chat function during the talk if you want to share any uh, observations or links to relevant research. Um, uh, that's been very productive as well. Okay, um, uh, we, we, I think that covers all of the housekeeping items. Uh, real pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Amy today. Uh, Amy did, uh, completed her PhD at the University of Toronto uh, together with an MA in Global Governance from the Belsilly School of International Affairs. She's currently a sharp funded postdoc at UBC and a visiting postdoc fellow here with us at the Center for Global Studies. Amy is a political scientist specializing in comparative energy and environmental policy. Her research explores the politics of fossil fuel development and pipelines, on which uh, she'll share some of her research today. And her book, Mega Pipelines, Mega Resistance, examines the causal impact of resistance to fossil fuel infrastructure. Amy, very much looking forward to this talk. Thank you so much for joining us, given everything else that's going on right now. Um, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Martin, for that really warm welcome. And I'm so grateful for everyone joining the center today, uh, physically in person and online. I'm really sorry I can't be there. Uh, some personal circumstances have kept me at home today, but I really appreciate everyone's understanding. Uh, and I also just wanna say thanks so much everyone for providing such a really warm welcome um, and intellectual community over the last, I guess, almost two years since I've been at the center. Uh, so I've been, been very grateful for that while being here. So I'll just take a moment to share my screen. And you should be able to see the slides there. Let me know if you can't. All right, so today I'll be presenting some work, uh, some new work uh, for the first time. Uh, and this is from my postdoctoral fellowship at UBC with Dr. Katherine Harrison, who's in the Department of Political Science as well. Uh, this project emerged both out of my PhD research and my new book project, uh, ongoing book project, uh, Mega Pipelines, Mega Resistance, which is about the impact of resistance to new mega oil sands pipelines uh, in North America. And I was fortunate enough to be able to share a bit about some of that research last year and get some great feedback. Um, and then this work dovetails with Dr. Ka uh, Her Kathy Harrison's research on the domestic political economy of fossil fuel supply. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Harrison couldn't be here today. She's teaching right now, but we're hoping to submit this article soon for a special issue. And we're presenting a, a similar presentation next week for the International Studies Association Conference. So the timing couldn't be better in terms of um, your questions and comments and a bit of a dry run of the presentation. So really appreciate any feedback that you have. So I'd just like to start by contextualizing the problem a bit. This is the most recent report from the International Governmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, and they found unsurprisingly that fossil fuels account for about 86% of global greenhouse gas emissions over the last decade. 
This really reinforces what we already know, which is that fossil fuels are the primary cause of the climate crisis. However, most countries uh, that produce fossil fuels still plan to continue increasing oil and gas production. The production gap report was first launched in 2019. It was developed by a group of organizations, including the UN Environment Programme, and it's designed to measure the gap between governments' planned fossil fuel production and global production levels that are consistent with the Paris Agreement. This image is from the most recent report, and it shows that countries' planned fossil fuel production significantly exceed not only global production levels commensurate with keeping one and a half degrees temperature, but also anticipated demand based on national emissions targets. And so as a result of the production gap, we need to phase out extraction for oil, gas, and coal, 4% per year between 2020 and 2030 for oil, 3% for gas, and 11% for coal. And we also know, thanks to recent scholarship, that about 60% of oil and fossil methane gas, or natural gas, and 90% of coal must remain in the ground by 2050, if we're to have even a 50% chance of limiting warming to one and a half degrees. Part of the problem is that attention to the production or the supply of fossil fuels, and I use those terms interchangeably, has been quite absent in global climate negotiations, and the Paris Agreement makes no mention of fossil fuels. Uh, this reflects the interests of the fossil fuel industry, and as well as the interests of fossil fuel producing states, and the really complex dynamics of what's known as carbon lock-in as well as the UN's focus on the demand or the consumption side of fossil fuels. So what do I mean by that? The norm in global climate governance to date and has, that's been reflected in the Paris Agreement has been to hold countries responsible for their greenhouse gas emissions that are released rather than the fossil fuels that are actually produced in their borders. And so although fossil fuels can be produced in one country and burned in another, global climate governance to date has really rested on this assumption that domestic politics to reduce and policies to reduce carbon uh, pollution will automatically translate to reducing fossil fuel supply. So in essence, the assumption is that if countries are responsible for carbon pollution within their borders, that will limit fossil fuels, but that's not been the case. Um, and this has been increasingly called into question by things including the recent production gap reports. There's also been a lot of pressure um, around an activism around fossil fuel supply. Uh, in particular, a campaign called the Fossil Fuel Nonproliferation Treaty. And this has really taken off, uh, especially in light of the, the recent climate negotiations that happened last year in Glasgow. And some countries are beginning to incorporate mention of fossil fuel production and transitions in their submissions uh, required by the Paris Agreement. So that led to a research question, which is how and to what extent do countries address fossil fuel production as opposed to consumption in their required submissions to the Paris Agreement or their nationally determined contributions or NDCs? In other words, how are countries addressing fossil fuel production in these submissions, if at all? To help us answer this question, we first looked at the interdisciplinary literature on fossil fuel supply. And this is really composed of two main approaches around global equity and around the modeling of global markets. Uh, the equity literature really develops some normative claims and principles around things like producing countries' capacity to transition or their historical responsibility for emissions. And this mostly is about what should or what ought to happen. And in contrast, the economic modeling literature takes a more positive as opposed to normative approach and anticipates production in different countries under different scenarios based on different levels of global climate ambition. And then we also incorporate insights from a third literature on comparative political economy and including the work of Dr. Kathy Harrison. 
And this really emphasizes the importance of domestic political economy drivers uh, within fossil fuel producing countries. And so we looked at all these literatures to really try to find insights about the incentives that different producer countries are facing. So now on to our data and methods. We assessed how producer states were responding to calls to address the production of fossil fuels in three steps. First, we gather the most recent nationally determined contributions or NDCs for each of our fossil fuel producing countries. As you might know, NDCs outline and communicate countries' climate plans beyond 2020, and they're required to submit these uh, NDCs every five years to the Secretariat of the UNFCCC or the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Though NDCs are the most consistent and comparable source of data that we have for fossil fuel producing countries' plans to mitigate their emissions, there's still a lot of variation in the quality and the clarity and the amount of detail in these plans. Uh, in general, they have improved over time, although we were still pretty astounded by the lack of quality in some cases. And we only included NDCs for fossil fuel producing countries, and we identified these based on their inclusion in BP's Statistical Review of World Energy. Um, BP didn't include data for every country, so we filled in the gaps uh, with a few other data sources. Um, and we had to exclude some countries where there was no English translation or where there was no NDC available. And so we ended up with uh, 59 NDCs in total. We then coded each of the NDCs with the help of a research assistant, and we were coding for whether countries explicitly mentioned uh, whether they were anticipating to continue or increase production of fossil fuels or to decrease production of fossil fuels. So that's oil, natural gas, and coal. We also looked for less explicit references to increasing production. So for example, some countries referred to their economic dependence on the production of fossil fuels or the fairness of their climate target in light of their dependence on fossil fuels. And then we also quoted for mitigation measures to reduce emissions associated with the production or transportation of fossil fuels. So this could include things like regulating methane, uh, carbon pricing, or investing in technologies like carbon capture and storage. And finally, we coded for transition planning. So this included things like references to economic diversification or to just transition policies and support for workers involved in the fossil fuel economy. Then to explore our hypotheses, we compared these components of the NDCs with data on countries' fossil fuel production, including their costs of production for oil and the carbon intensity of oil production. In general, information on fossil fuel production is uh, perhaps surprisingly very incomplete and inconsistent, um, but we, we made the best of the data that we had. And then we also used some additional data on the trade of fossil fuels and some other measures, including things like human development index to get a sense of, of income levels for countries. And we used 2015 as the baseline for all of our data uh, since the first NDC started uh, rolling in in 2016 after the Paris Agreement. So onto our findings. Our first expectation was that countries that have higher income and therefore have more capacity for a just transition or a transition away from fossil fuels, that they should be the first to wind down production and invest in diversification. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, we found very little evidence of this. Most of the countries that we coded were ranked as having either high or very high human development. And the only country of all of these high income countries that explicitly referenced decreasing oil production was Oman. Um, and they have quite a significant target. They're aiming to reduce their reliance on, um, from GDP on oil from around 40% down to 16% uh, between 2017 and 2030, and down to just 8% by 2040. In contrast, almost a quarter of our higher income countries explicitly referred to increasing oil, gas, or coal production. And most of these countries reference economic fairness, 
uh, and different arguments, usually as rationales for their delayed action. So for example, Kazakhstan suggested that their economic growth uh, should increase to reach the level of other OECD countries, and Kuwait and Qatar referenced negative economic impacts from global climate action. So essentially they're talking about their economic vulnerability uh, if other countries are taking their climate commitment seriously. Uh, there were also references to economic diversification and some jobs associated with just transition policies, uh, including, for example, in Canada. Um, but in general, rather than planning for declining production, many higher income countries cited efforts to reduce production related emissions. So these took a number of measures, um, including reference to carbon taxes, either actually in implementation or being proposed in the future. Uh, things like reducing methane emissions from leaking and flaring, which is usually sort of considered the low hanging fruit of emissions reduction. Uh, and then lots of investments in new technologies. So things like uh, carbon capture and storage, direct air capture or uh, clean hydrogen from fossil fuels. Our second hypothesis was that higher cost producers are more likely to plan for a decline than lower cost producers. And this is really because of the core finding in a lot of the modeling literature, which suggests that there's going to be lower demand for fossil fuels in response to climate mitigation. And this will dampen global energy prices. And this will disproportionately benefit lower cost producers. And so in theory, higher cost producers should see the writing on the wall and start planning accordingly. Um, but again, we found very little evidence of this uh, and you're starting to see the trend uh, that we found. So to identify higher cost producers, we use uh, what's called the global volume weighted average, the marginal cost of oil production, uh, using previous research from Mazdani and colleagues in 2021. And this average really corresponds with the breakpoint between conventional oil and the more challenging to extract uh, unconventional oils like the oil sands. And we found that only one of the 24 uh, countries that were in this category had uh, an intentional decline of oil production. And again, this was Oman. Instead, we found uh, considerable evidence of plan increase. And this is consistent with what's known as the green paradox. And that's this idea that higher cost producers are willing to increase production while they still can, even if they risk stranding their assets in the long term. And our third finding is about the carbon intensity of production. Our expectation was that as climate action accelerates, efforts to reduce the production of emissions will increase production costs. And this is going to have a bigger impact on those that are more carbon intensive. And so we'd expect that they're more likely to plan for decline. However, again, we found very limited evidence of this. And rather than planning for declin declining demand, we found that there were higher carbon intensity countries that were identifying some strategies to reduce their mitigation. Uh, and some of them were mentioning anticipating uh, international carbon markets, which don't yet exist, um, but there was often a lot of reference to, to potential mitigation measures, whether they were in practice or uh, in a lot of cases, sort of hypothetical future reliance on international carbon markets or carbon capture and storage and things like that. And then our last expectation was about trade. And we expected that producers who are net exporters of fossil fuels will be less likely than net importers to plan for decline. And this is because those that are producing for export have weaker pressure to plan for reducing production. And this is for a few reasons. Uh, first, fossil fuel exporters benefit economically without bearing the cost to reduce their combustion emissions. And also these countries are often very reliant on the income from fossil fuel exports in things like royalties and tax revenue. And conversely, producers that are net importers, so typically producing for their own domestic consumption, have greater incentives to transition because of the potential for domestic jobs and clean energy, 
that can, in some cases, more than substitute for the loss of domestic jobs in fossil fuel production. And so we define net exporters using uh, data from the IEA, the World Energy Balance Database, and we looked at fossil fuel exports relative to domestic consumption. And among exporters, again, only Oman intended to transition away from oil. Uh, and Canada was also mentioned, uh, they have a measure related to decline in coal uh, around phasing out coal fire power plants. Although Canada's coal exports are largely metallurgical, and so they actually wouldn't be really affected by phasing out coal fire power plants. So returning to our theoretical expectations, uh, first around equity, there's long since been concerns around equity embedded in the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement, especially through this principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, the CBDR. And that's really this idea that wealthy countries should be bearing responsibility for mitigation. But in general, equity of production has really been ignored. And we found that while lower income countries are twice as likely to acknowledge plans for increasing production in their NDCs compared to higher income countries, we're still missing leadership from higher income countries in constraining production and taking the lead and doing so as implied by the principle of common but differentiated responsibility. Uh, and interestingly, both higher and lower income countries alike uh, spoke a lot about their economic vulnerability to global climate action in their NDCs. Second, economic modeling suggests that there's an economic rather than moral rationale for at least some fossil fuel producing countries to start declining production. Uh, and that's really that higher cost and higher carbon intensity producers are going to be more vulnerable in the transition away from fossil fuels. However, looking at oil production specifically, we found no evidence of this. Among the higher cost producers, only Oman anticipates decline, and among higher carbon intensity producers, only Oman and India plan to do so. Um, but both of these countries appear to be experiencing declining production, uh, as a result of depleted reserves, rather than being motivated by climate imperatives. Uh, instead, our findings were really suggestive of the green paradox, and although there's several seemingly vulnerable high-cost producers, um, they're very candid with their uh, plans to increase production. And though they might see the writing on the wall, in the short term, their efforts are really uh, focused around increasing fossil fuel supply. Uh, and this will perhaps undermine climate action by reducing global prices. So in short, these countries are not guided by this rationale either. But in contrast to the moral and economic imperatives, we found stronger support for the importance of domestic political economy drivers. And so we found that fossil fuel producing countries that are net importers are more likely to cite plans for production decline than net exporters. And this is consistent with the political appeal of substituting domestically produced clean energy and associated domestic jobs for imported fossil fuels. These plans really appear to reflect uh, specific fuels rather than having a, an overall national strategy. Uh, for example, there is lots of references or several references in fossil fuel producers NDCs to transitioning away from coal fired electricity. While this actually isn't a supply side policy because it's electricity produced uh, for domestic consumption, which can be imported, uh, it's really consistent with our trade hypothesis and the fact that a lot of coal producers are producing um, coal for their own domestic consumption and so they're net importers. Um, but in contrast to signs of promise around coal, lower and higher income fossil fuel producers are like are really embracing this idea of using fossil methane gas or natural gas as a transition fuel. Fourth, while there is some degree of talking the talk with lots of references to just transition or transition planning, there are very few, if any, fossil fuel producing states that are really walking the walk with concrete plans for managing a decline in production, particularly of oil and gas. 
And lastly, although all parties to the Paris Agreement have embraced the goal of limiting temperature increase to one and a half degrees, fossil fuel producing countries really imply a remarkable denial that meeting this target will mean lowering their levels of fossil fuel production. And so there is some promise in net importers political incentives to transition to clean energy, neither the moral obligations uh, from the UNFCCC or the prospect of global market contraction have been sufficient to date to prompt fossil fuel producers to plan for a managed and just transition. And so our conclusion really reinforces recommendations from other folks to complement uh, really almost exclusive international focus on the emissions from fossil fuel consumption and the reporting requirements that come with it in the NDCs to greater international collaboration to constrain and address fossil fuel production. So I will leave it there for now. Uh, thanks so much and really looking forward to some questions. Thank you, Amy. I'm really looking forward to this discussion too. It's, a, it's a, another reminder of all of the uh, challenges the world faces today too, isn't it? So I'll ask people to put up their hand or, or um, grab my attention. If you feel comfortable, please do turn on your video. I'll do my best not to keep my back to the people in the room. Amy, perhaps I could get us started. Um, I, I, it's how depressing it is that there's, you have so, few, so little evidence of people walk, uh, of countries walking the walk. I'm wondering, is there any kind of um, evidence of, uh, to the extent that there is some response, sort of a demonstration of that, of one country seeing what another country is doing and adjusting their behavior accordingly, um, either in terms of a positive results such as they are, or maybe even perhaps the better way to ask is in terms of say the denial is, is there any sense in which different countries are aware of each other in that response and um, um, uh, acting accordingly? Yeah. Okay. yeah, that's a super question. So I'll answer sort of more positively. Uh, on the one hand, we do have some countries that have joined the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance, which is a really new alliance that really flowed out of the, uh, that campaign that I mentioned, the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. Around Glasgow, there were some diplomatic negotiations between countries to start to actually phase out or to commit publicly to phase out um, oil and gas and coal. However, a lot of countries that signed on were either uh, states within countries, so Quebec actually signed on, uh, so there's some you know, jurisdictional issues, or they're countries that have limited or declining reserves of fossil fuels. Uh, so rather than having, you know, big producers signing on, they tend to be sort of less significant in terms of production. Although uh, Angela Carter and other folks have argued that we shouldn't underestimate the kind of symbolic power of uh, things like the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance, that they're putting normative pressure and building coalitions to start putting uh, greater pressure on some of the bigger producers. But on the denial front, yeah, it's quite interesting that within the OPEC countries, there's a lot of very sort of shared common narratives around economic dependence, um, lower costs and cost effectiveness of production and things like that, that you see um, shared amongst those countries. And so you see very much kind of a, a sort of shared narrative around justification of fossil fuel production. And similarly around gas, uh, this idea of natural gas as a bridge fuel. And you have a lot of countries uh, using the kind of similar language in their NDCs around helping other countries uh, reduce their reliance on coal, for example, by exporting natural gas. Okay. And uh, I'll open it up, but I guess the flip side to that potential for competition, um, as we sort of discussed earlier, um, one country saying that their resources are cleaner, more ethical, whatever it be, right, than another country. Uh, Tamara, can I turn it over to you, please? Yeah. Um, thank, thank you, Amy, for this research. It's so great to see such a broad overview among so many different countries and this analysis of NDCs. And um, I guess I had a question similar to the previous one because 
Looking at, uh, I was, for instance, really surprised to see that Oman is the only one reducing oil production because New Zealand, for instance, is, I'm sure you know, I mean, they've said that they will have no more offshore oil, offshore oil and gas permits. And Denmark has is the largest oil economy so far to have a complete phase out date to 2050. And I just wonder, knowing this and knowing, for instance, that 14 EU states have also stopped coal or committed to stop it before 2030. I mean, we see all these commitments and we know that these are major commitments in many cases. Denmark's is a pretty important one, but if they're not showing up in the NDC. So I just wonder how you capture that um, and why that would be the case and then how you can supplement the NDC analysis with all of these important commitments that have been made. Yeah, thanks, Swara. That's a, a super question, and I'm glad you mentioned it, because one kind of important limitation of our work is that for the EU, there aren't individual country submissions. So we just analyzed the EU general submission, and it's quite vague, and it doesn't mention a lot of these commitments that are coming up uh, at the national level. So that's something that uh, certainly, a, there's a lot of political movement in the EU, like you said, around um, Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance. There's quite a few sort of first movers like Denmark that are in the EU. Um, although, yeah, unfortunately, just with the structure of how the, the EU has their general target and then countries just sort of adopt um, the, the EU submission in general. So they're all identical, unfortunately, which gives us um, less to work with. Um, but yeah, it's really Im important to recognize that where a lot of this movement is coming from is within some of the, the producer states in, in the European context. Yeah, that might be um, for your analysis really important to mention because a lot of those commitments are in fact much more stringent than, than the European Union commitments, right? And um, just wanted to mention too, the, the finding about the high cost and carbon intensity producers ignoring economic rationale. I found that interesting. I did want to mention in Denmark, it was an economic rationale that drove that decision to end oil and gas, which is really important to mention, right? Um, and that that commitment was made back all the way back in 2006, there was already that agenda. It's just not economically viable for them to do that anymore. And, ignoring all of the climate, you know, rationale. So that's, that's great. And again, just thank you for your work. Can't wait to see the publication that comes out of this. Thanks, Tamara. Thanks, Tamara. Rod, can I ask you to turn, unmute yourself? Yeah, thank you very much for that presentation. It is, it is great to see the, uh, <laughs> the, the actual facts being confronted with all of the uh, declarations. Uh, just as a, a side note, I'm, I'm wondering whether there's a bureaucratic explanation for, for uh, the phenomenon that Tamara mentioned that, that we have different bureaus responsible for preparing the NDCs and, and providing the publicity for, for policy announcements. And it may just be that, that uh, some of the policies that uh, ought to be showing up in the NDCs haven't yet done so. It's just purely uh, communications failure. Um, I had a couple of comments and, and then uh, wondered about um, one question. I, and this morning, you know, on this, on this um, uh, complete uh, contradiction between uh, general intentions and, and, uh, and, and practical activity, there was a, a little note that I noticed this morning that Namibia, which, um, is a very very poor country and apparently has the the highest level of income inequality measured income inequality after South Africa um, was announcing their interest in uh, um, new offshore fields that were going to be the difference between their current circumstances and the prosperity that uh, awaited them once this big new uh, field actually got developed so you can you can certainly see how the pressures on the politicians uh, build up. Um, the other thing I'm wondering about is uh, how much all of this might change if, um, if we find that uh, the effort to get off Russian oil and energy, oil and gas, uh, will actually lead to 
to something much larger in terms of, of off oil and gas uh, generally for, for the world. I mean, it, it may be that um, some of the pressures we're seeing for finding alternatives to that Russian supply will actually be alternatives to fossil fuels. And that would be an, an interesting thing to follow, obviously not part of your research program at the moment, but, but it's intriguing to think about. Um, and then finally, the, the question I wondered about, uh, Oman shows up very dramatically. Uh, is, is, can one imagine that to be a personality thing? I mean, it's a small enough state that the, the personality of the uh, leaders um, or, or something in the culture, or is it something that one can explain on sort of political economy grounds? So that would be my question. And thanks again for the talk. Thanks, Rod. That's really, yeah, those are really helpful comments and questions. Uh, I hadn't seen the, that announcement about Namibia, but certainly um, Kenya is one of the countries that we look at and they have uh, fairly low levels of oil production, but have, have really invested a lot of resources into sort of finding every last drop of oil that they can um, and using this rationale of sort of common but differentiated responsibilities um, to justify increasing oil production. Uh, in terms of the, the Russia situation, yeah, you're certainly quite right. I mean, there's this huge battle right now that we see in, in Canada between those that are suggesting that um, building more oil and gas pipelines is going to lead to greater energy security uh, and, and those that, that argue the opposite. And so, yeah, I think this is sort of the uh, the new frontier for these sort of entrenched groups of interest to be to be fighting uh, on these lines um, and yeah I, I will similarly be very interested in, in how um, it'll either spur in some cases in some countries you know greater investment in renewables versus sort of doubling down on oil and gas production for those that have the capacity to, that um, that have that infrastructure in place. And then lastly, the question about Oman in terms of what's really going on. I really um, don't have a lot of expertise uh, at the country level. And so this is sort of new research for me, I kind of out of my comfort zone. I really like in-depth, um, you know, case comparisons. And so I really don't have a clear picture of what's going on domestically. Um, other than to say, it seems like part of it is certainly the political economy uh, rationale that there are declining reserves. And so um, there's just really, not that much significant production that can happen in the future. And really, I think it was quite a wake up call uh, in the last few years, this recognition that there is a significant economic risk uh, of not diversifying. Um, I can't really speak too much more to the other, the other factors that might be involved, um, but, but welcome any comments, anyone who knows more than I about, about the case of Oman. Thank you, Rod. Thank you, Amy. I'm willing to jump in. Thank you. Um, so it's great. That's great talk. I love the way you compile the evidence, and I like the uh, hopeful um, expectations as you, you lay them out. But I wonder if you can push just a little tighter on this question of the political economy part. Like, I, I guess on, on a superficial sort of just being in the room and not having thought about much, it, it seems to be telling us that announcements of or policy promises are actually no indicator of policy, that they may have no connection whatsoever, uh, whether you're in a called more democratic state or, or arguably you know, less democratic state. And so I wonder if that doesn't reveal a question of well, what does then, right? And if you're saying that you know, economic actors aren't acting economically rational, why is that? Probably because they have actually a subset that they're operating to. And you know, I mean, it's pessimistic for those people who believe in good institutions and promises made and promises delivered. But then it makes the battle maybe a little easier in a way because then we really have to get to the accountability part of the problem. And maybe then, I mean, I have no answers off the top of my head, but maybe we can start thinking about that in a different way. You can also tell me I'm totally crazy and that's not helpful, but like, I guess that's kind of what I take out of there. Um, I'm not surprised by the results, but I'm a bit surprised at how blatantly across the board people are making empty promises. Yeah, I mean, it's a terrific set of questions and comments and 
Uh, I, I think I really agree for the most part with, with everything that you said. I mean, it, it was honestly shocking. The quality of the NDCs was so poor. And until we actually went in and read them, I had no idea how anyone can use <laughs> these submissions to generate any kind of, um, you know, quality sort of scenario for, for you know, modeling or prediction forecasts and those kinds of things, which the UN actually does, but um, they use a different set of tools uh, as well as the NDCs. But the, I think at the heart of it, accountability is a, is a huge piece of it. And just the lack of information that we have, even on basic questions around reserves of fossil fuels, production of fossil fuels, costs of production, carbon intensity. I mean, a lot of our time was spent just scrounging data together um, in, in whatever you know capacity we had. And a lot of it is private, but there is some research and there are some uh, international agencies like the IEA that do a fairly good job of putting this together. But still there's, there's really an absence of even just sort of basic agreement on, on some numbers for a lot of these kinds of things around production. Uh, so there's been calls for uh, to have a, a database for for more data on fossil fuel production as sort of a, a very basic starting point. And it would be, I think, terrific to see, and politically this is not really feasible, but to see, you know, the UNFCCC process uh, align more carefully with, with calls for reducing the supply of fossil fuels. Um, but certainly I think, yeah, to get to that accountability, there's, there's quite a few other things that need to be in place. Um, that aren't. Although I am hopeful, I mean, Glasgow, the negotiations generally were seen, I think, as quite, um, by folks, quite a disappointment. Although for the first time there was mention of uh, phasing out um, certain subsidies for fossil fuels, uh, which was the first time we saw this kind of language in a, a UN climate negotiation document. But it's still really just scratching the surface in terms of, of what needs to be done, although it, it did open the door. Uh, a crack. Thank you. Uh, Kristen. Yeah, thank you, Amy, for a great presentation. Um, mine isn't necessarily a question, it's more of a point to Tamara's question a little bit more as well. So I know that uh, the European Commission collects data for countries in, U in the European Union who violate or who do not comply with the European Union regulations. So the European Commission scoreboard basically has these infringement cases and they kind of rate how, how aligned these European countries are with the regulations and they do have specific environmental indicators as well. So in, in case you want to push that a little further and want to see if there is maybe the European countries, you can distinguish them a little bit more in a second paper or follow up paper, you might want to check out the European Commission's scoreboard and a variety of scoreboards so you need to find. I just tried to find it, but I couldn't. Um, um, so, but that's maybe something you can you can see if there is maybe any differences between the countries. Maybe that you know, Denmark might be popping out there as well. I don't know for sure, but that could be something you you might want to do in the future. Mm, that's super helpful. I really appreciate that because um, it would be very interesting to move away from NDCs as a data source now that we have really like exhausted ourselves of trying to pull uh, useful information out of them. So that's that's a really great suggestion. Thanks. Yeah. Tamara, go ahead. Yeah, I might add, <laughs> expanding on your research further, I mean, under the European Commission's Just Transition Mechanism, which is $150 billion <sighs> for a suite of investments, including the use of regional and social development funds, every European country will is delivering a very, very concrete national just transition plan, which is linked to spatial planning strategies as well. Now these are being developed, this is a new instrument, it's being developed in this programming period, but that's gonna be a really rich source of in, um, information because it's going to be very concrete about how they're meeting those commitments. Thanks Tamara, that's super. Well, if you're interested in writing that paper in the future, <laughs> when they come out, then yeah, that would be terrific. <laughs> I've, I've never been to Oman, but um, I, I, if I could build a bit on the question that Rod asked, um, I suppose with any kind of monarchy, you are going to have the personal whims of the leader factor in differently, especially in terms of, you know, 
It's highlighting the significance of domestic pressure or an attempt to respond, if only, if only rhetorically, to domestic pressure. But I wonder if um, I, my sense is that Oman does have, uh, it, it is more expensive to extract its resources, say, than neighboring Saudi Arabia or, or Qatar and its nat natural gas fields. But, um, but I wonder too if it does have uh, an, an advantage in terms of, say, solar or wind, given its geographical location. Maybe there are certain kind of advantages that it would have in terms of comparison, comparative or alternative. Yeah. But I also wondered, um, what, what, if I if I understood this correctly, Oman was um, promising a reduction in the percentage of the contribution of this resource to an overall GDP, right? So it's a relative reduction rather than necessarily an absolute one. I suppose if you can if you can find some magic way of increasing your GDP, then you can go on continuing to the, with the same extraction. So I wonder if, if that actually can play a role in this. Like, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to doubt the, the intentions of the Omani government, but I suppose there is some wiggle room there. <laughs> Yeah, you're absolutely right. And it's a great point. I mean, this debate about relative versus absolute emissions is something that a lot of fossil fuel producers sort of play this game. But you're right to pick up on that in the case of Oman, that it was contribution to GDP, which I've never yeah. seen any country talk about uh, any kind of target in relation to GDP, which is uh, sort of sort of strange or unusual. So I think you're right to question or to think about, you know, what what this might mean and what the implications are. Mm -hmm. And I think it could just be recognized in a reality given the declining, the, 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 the decline in its access to those resources. It could happen anyways, just because, uh, uh, yeah. sorry, Rod. Um, yeah, I think that, that that is an interesting thing. Like the uh, appeal to intensity numbers, of course, it, it is another way of making things look good when in fact they ought not to be looking so good. I wanted to pick up a little bit uh, on, on uh, Oliver's comment about accountability and just since we've moved a little bit beyond your presentation itself, speculate the, the confidence and supply agreement that we've just seen. Um, does it give us a chance to, to put some domestic pressure on in, in the direction of, of the just transition, if you like, the, uh, the much greater um, uh, pressure on um, moving forward with the, um, the, the International uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty and moving forward domestically with, with uh, some real action on moving uh, economic activity out of the fossil fuel industry, and even perhaps getting rid of these uh, uh, subsidies, which keep promising to go away and somehow never do. Uh, but anyway, just just for speculation, uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a great question. And to be honest, I haven't given this so much thought as it's as it's just happened uh, really recently, and kind of caught me by surprise. But I thought it was interesting around fossil fuels specifically. I mean, one of the key policy areas for coordination is around fossil fuel subsidies. And I mean, a lot of that hinges on whether or not you you think of the Trans Mountain expansion purchase as a fossil fuel subsidy, which of course the NDP does, the liberals don't. Uh, so I don't anticipate anything sort of significant happening with that, but um, in terms of the purchase itself. Um, but I think the NDP will be really pushing hard on reducing some of those other fossil fuel subsidies, which the government has really dragged their feet on. Um, so in some ways, there might be some leverage uh, there. Uh, I'm heartened by the Net Zero Accountability Act. And I think there'll be a, a lot of really interesting things to keep an eye on in the next couple months as that gets rolled out. And I expect the NDP will be sort of holding the government's boots to the fire there. Um, and I think seeing, you know, a harder cap on oil sands production come out of the Net Zero uh, Accountability Act, I think that will probably be the most significant, I mean, it has the potential to be the most significant climate policy uh, for fossil fuel production for, our, for the federal government. Um, and so, yeah, I'd expect to see the NDP continuing to work closely. I don't know in terms of sort of the mechanics and I welcome any sort of Canadian politics scholars insights on this in terms of really what's different um, with the supply agreement as and sort of formalizing what we already kind of knew from the kind of collaboration that was happening with 
with the government, the federal government and the NDP, but um, yeah, welcome any, any dissenting opinions on that. I can't dissent, but I, I have <laughs> other thoughts that will go a different way. Because I'm intrigued by the non-proliferation treaty notion. I hadn't, that's new to me, so um, I, I may not be fully understanding it. But I'm wondering if, if, if there's a parallel or the other way, which is um, states will only trade with states that have viable climate policies. For lack of a better, is that is that the other side of that coin? And wouldn't that be more likely to get traction? Like, like you, how you can imagine, you know, you know, historically we have these geographic trading blocks, like you know, North America. Oh, but imagine a future where we have trading blocks based on carbon policies. I will only trade with other nations who are playing the same game as I am because I'm actually protecting my own producers by doing that because then they're not gonna scream disadvantage. And so you create a tension for a virtuous circle, I mean, naively, and would that be the parallel to what you're talking about as far as basically saying that the bad actor states should somehow restrain themselves from spreading their troublesome carbon products? Yeah, I mean, you hit the nail right on the head in terms of what's happening right now with discussions around, it's called border carbon adjustment. And it's essentially that, um, a way to penalize countries that don't have a carbon price on, um, you know, that would disproportionately increase costs of production for countries that do have a carbon price. So for example, Canada has really stepped up lately um, as trying to lead some of these conversations. But the flip side is that you're often then penalizing countries who are lower income and have higher cost of production and don't have a price on carbon. So these negotiations are, they're interesting because domestically they can be quite popular. Like in the Canadian context, you have support from labor unions uh, and big industries, you know, like steel, um, cement, and, and some of the, the more intensive industrial sectors, as well as typically support from climate organizations. So politically, domestically, they can be quite popular, although they can lead to quite a lot of, um, I think, unintended negative consequences, if not really carefully designed for less uh, high income countries. But in terms of conversations linking kind of the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance and the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Agreement, they haven't made those connections to things like trade and carbon border adjustment. So that's a really interesting uh, sort of space to maybe think about how these things, how these sort of siloed discussions um, will have impacts on, on the other. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting point. Kristen. I think the problem is there, I mean, joining that conversation is also that we don't really have a global governing body and some like organization which can control, like, I mean, we do have the World Trade Organization, but I mean, how much power and how much significance does institutions like that have on a global scale as well? There's, like having no one to govern these activities might be the biggest problem, I think, in my opinion. Yeah, just to quickly respond to that. Yeah, the WTO hasn't been typically, you know, the most um, environmentally progressive uh, governing body. And there's been a lot of conflict with various sort of environmental policies uh, running into problems with WTO law. And again, border carbon adjustment, there's a lively sort of debate in the legal community about designing something that would be WTO um, sort of approved uh, and to what extent this would be governed by the WTO in some kind of agreement is unclear. I think it would be sort of these bilateral negotiations and deals. Uh, we're starting to see, you know, some conversations with Canada and the EU and Canada and the US along, along the lines of border carbon adjustment. And so you're right, not having these are not global conversations. These are kind of bilateral talks. And I think if we do see any movement on border carbon adjustment, it would be these kind of piecemeal sort of discussions and negotiations. And then other countries kind of get brought in either 
um, because they're negatively impacted or, or they wanna do something similar. Yeah. Um, yes, please. Yeah, Amy. Um, thank you for your presentation. That was uh, that is really wonderful. Um, yeah, I just want to find out uh, two things. Um, that uh, your findings about Kenya um, were there other African countries uh, that is of interest in terms of your subject matter and whether the issues are being driven by economic imperative as against like political will and also institutional capacity of these developing countries. Uh, what is also interesting is that uh, this NDC are basically voluntary instrument. So it enforcement or implementation, you know, it's, it's, it's not mandatory. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, so countries, you know, usually will make big promises, but when it comes to the implementation, I mean, it's very weak on the ground. Thank you, Marshall. Yeah, thanks so much for that question. Yeah, in terms of the kind of key African countries that we looked at in our data set, they were South Africa, Chad, and Kenya in terms of bigger producers. Um, and yeah, one of the, the major kind of commonalities with, with African countries, but also lower income countries was having requests for international support from the international community in terms of, you know, capacity building, technology transfer and the like in order to meet their, their uh, targets. So usually they'll have conditional targets based on whether or not they get this kind of funding or capacity building support and then targets if they don't. And so in some of the more recent updated NDCs like South Africa, for example, there was a really detailed budget essentially uh, in terms of what was needed. And so this really builds on the long kind of contentious history of common but differentiated responsibility where again, we had a pretty significant failure at the Glasgow negotiations to deliver on on global funding for uh, lower income countries to meet their climate plans. Uh, so again, a lot of these countries are, are just uh, stuck in a, you know, between a rock and a hard place in terms of not having necessarily the capacity to, to meet their targets um, and, and the international community not delivering on those commitments as well. And really sort of a gridlock there. Did that answer your question? I know, I think you had a part two as well. Oh, I think uh, you've covered all. Uh, basically, I wanted to know, uh, you know, the issues in uh, some of the African country and you mentioned Chad, you know. Nigeria is also one of the, you know, uh, in Africa, one of the biggest uh, producing, uh, you know, oil countries. And it, like, uh, with other, uh, colleagues who have asked this question uh, earlier, it would be good to bring in some level of context. But I understand that uh, the analysis is just limited to document review, you know, and um, you know, and because of time constraint, it would have been interesting to look at expert in like uh, views. You conduct few as expert interview, you know, to dig into some of the issues that are coming up. Yeah, I forgot to mention Nigeria it was a really interesting case because they they did have sort of a temporary decline in, in revenue from oil in 2014, sort of due to the economic um, sort of lack of competitiveness, again, like a higher cost producer, um, but again, another country that sort of fully intends to embrace production, although align more closely with some of the other sort of OPEC producers interested in reducing methane and, you know, em emissions from flaring and venting and that kind of thing. And I think maybe one of the only countries in Africa, the only country in Africa that joined the global methane pledge, um, which, uh, which sort of puts them on the map in terms of their intentions to reduce uh, methane emissions. But yeah, thanks for mentioning Nigeria. Well, thank you. Thank you, Amy, for such a, 
rich and helpful, very useful discussion. Thanks for all of you for attending. I feel so fortunate that I can that I can learn so much every Wednesday morning from such an incredible group of people. So Amy, thanks so much and uh, all best wishes with uh, weeks ahead.